much, Jess. Uh, this should be a lot of fun. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight for another one of these programs. This is uh, a little bit different, a little bit more of a, a somber topic, but we'll see that Norman Rockwell handles it with his characteristic good humor and um, and and uh, his good heart. So uh, we're going to dive into the image that I have up on the screen here, but a little bit later in the program. Let me give you. Let's start off with the lay of the land and how we're going to spend the next hour together. First, we're going to do a brief introduction to Norman Rockwell. I'm sure he's an artist that needs no introduction for most of you. So we'll just cover that pretty quickly. Then we'll do a, a very brief overview of the history of depiction of conflict in American art. So I just wanted to show you what Norman Rockwell was sort of responding to and how what he does particularly with his World War II images, how he handles the, the subject of war a little differently. And then we'll dive right into it. And, and I've sort of uh, grouped his World War II images into a couple of different categories. We'll look at a few of his World War I images to begin with. Then the character of Willie Gillis, a GI that he kind of follows through training and, and into battle. And then uh, the Four Freedoms, those uh, four beloved images, which also have a nice sort of Thanksgiving connection to them as well. Heroes at Home, and then um, the GIs returning back from war. So a lot to cover and, um, and a lot of great rich images too. So let's start off with Norman Rockwell. Um, he's, like I said, an artist that's familiar to most. I love this photograph of him because he's smiling and he looks like he's just cracked a joke here. And I think it's really good for us to keep in mind that so many of his works um, have this sense of humor to them in addition to the storytelling. So, um, so just as a reminder, he was born before the turn of the century. He died just before the 1980s began. And he, uh, even during his lifetime, was considered considered America's most beloved illustrator. Uh, today, though, he is being re-examined by art historians, and his work, I think, is um, enjoying sort of a, a new appreciation by sort of high, high, the high art field, uh, as well as sort of mass media consumption. So he did have a fine arts background. He received formal training in the arts. And then he had this incredible long career with the Saturday Evening Post. And he was probably at his most prolific during the 1940s and 50s when the Saturday Evening Post had uh, a circulation anywhere from four to six million uh, readers. And then in addition to that, just think of how those, um, how, you know, every newsstand was decked out with these cover illustrations and how these images that he created were just sort of permeated throughout society. So it's important to think about how his work um, reflected American culture and really helped to define it. And that being said, Norman Rockwell is an artist who is so closely associated with patriotic themes, even beyond um, the fact that he painted so many images related to wartime. So just a quick reminder, he had a really long relationship with the Boy Scouts of America, um, I, something around uh, 64 years in terms of a relationship with the organization. Here's a self-portrait he painted where he's surrounded by the Boy Scouts as he's at work here. This is from 1966. But the kinds of images generally he was painting for the Boy Scouts uh, reinforced the, the connection of the Scouts to American history and sort of spoke to this reverence to the founding fathers a lot of the time. So here we've got these young scouts kind of looking over their, their shoulders at almost like a mirage of um, George Washington genuflecting in prayer just before going into battle. And in addition to working with the Boy Scouts, he also painted presidential portraits on both sides of the aisle. And, um, and just before the end of his life, uh, in 1976, as, as the country was celebrating the bicentennial, he painted this cover for the, um, the magazine American Artist. And so he, here he's really closely associating himself with uh, the iconic Liberty Bell. And, um, and in this case, the, the bell is representing, I think, to some degree, both America and, and Norman Rockwell. 
And then finally, of course, his uh, long work in the field of the arts was uh, awarded and recognized with the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 19. Uh, 77. So G Gerald Ford gave that to him. And this is the artist again sitting in his studio and checking out that award. So, so that's Norman Rockwell in a nutshell. Let's shift gears for just a moment. And this is a very, very brief introduction to war in American art. So uh, so I have sort of one or two images from each of the, the uh, major battles for us to consider. So here's our Revolutionary War scene. And this was painted by an artist named John Trumbull. This is a scene of the Battle of Bunker Hill and the death of General Warren, who we see here on the ground. Now we know that the artist John Trumbull was actually at the Battle of Bunker Hill. And so he's... Uh, He's an eyewitness, but he painted this picture 11 years after the fact. And I think it's important to keep in mind that this, this isn't necessarily a document of the war. It's more or less an image to help codify the important stories of the war. So here we have a martyr, we have villains, um, we have people who are sort of assisting in all of this, and it's a, it's a way to reinforce the, the dominant narratives associated with the Revolutionary War. And of course, there's, you know, there's the chaos of war and all of that here, but this is really about um, sort of the, the composition and the storytelling here an important element to keep in mind. So when we flash forward to the Civil War, we can see that an artist like Winslow Homer has a really different goal in creating images like the one that you see up on the screen. So the image on the left is called the Cavalry Charge. It's from 1862. And, um, and, and I should mention both of these images were reproduced in the magazine Harper's Weekly. So, um, so that had a huge circulation during the Civil War. And, and this was how people were sort of consuming uh, news about the war. And I would say with the cavalry charge, you don't get a story about winners or losers, martyrs or villains here. Um, this is chaos. This is kind of terrifying chaos. And, um, and we do see people sort of being um, crushed and people and you know other soldiers with with their swords up in the air but um but i think the overwhelming amount the, the overwhelming story here is that that this is a, a large terrifying battle on the right we see a really kind of different image it's just one soldier and it's called the sharpshooter and for the time this would have been sort of cutting ed edge technology and this would have been a really terrifying image for people who were alive during the Civil War, because this is, you know, being able to take out uh, your enemy without even really confronting them. I mean, you can be hidden up in a tree here. So, so Winslow Homer was showing some pretty terrifying scenes in these um, in these prints that he was creating for Harper's Weekly. The other uh, thing for us to keep in mind is that during the Civil War, we also have um, the sort of new use of photography in documenting the Civil War. And so here we have Timothy O'Sullivan's uh, um, Harvest of Death at Gettysburg. And photography still had long enough exposure times that, um, that you weren't really uh, capturing images of battle the, the way that um, Winslow Homer was. Instead, it's the aftermath and it's it's the death and destruction after, after a battle, which again, these images uh, were circulated wide and far and all of a sudden Americans could really see the horror of the war in their own living rooms. And then the last sort of historical image I wanted to show you is from the American expatriate artist, John Singer Sargent. So this is a, a monumental painting called Gast. It's from 1919 and it measures about 20 feet long. So the figures in, in the picture are probably uh, just over life size. And what we're seeing here is, um, is how new technologies uh, sort of like the sharpshooter uh, from the Civil War, but the new technology of mustard gas in this case uh, caused you know, sort of uh, horrific outcomes for soldiers that managed to survive battles. So we're seeing just sort of piles of figures in the foreground whose eyes have been bandaged be because they've been blinded by the mustard gas. And then we see this column of soldiers who are moving across 
um, the length of this canvas heading towards a medical tent, which would be just off the, the edge of the frame here. And, um, and then in the distance, we can see another column of soldiers. So this is really a picture about the very human um, impact of, of war itself. And then also these, the, the new technologies that were being developed in order to kind of uh, create uh, uh, a, higher, a higher death toll. So, uh, so we see increasingly that uh, depictions of war oftentimes focused on the scariest aspects of war and the very human impact uh, that war had on the soldiers that were fighting. So now <laughs> let's shift gears again and look at Norman Rockwell and sort of how he began to depict images of war. And surprise, surprise, he takes a very different tone with his images. Um, in fact, if we just do a quick comparison here, we can see that uh, compared to John Trumbull, who's doing, uh, again, sort of the storytelling, um, codifying, you know, the, the martyrs and the villains uh, of a war, the heroes of a war, we can see that Norman Rockwell Rockwell is, is not at all concerned with painting pictures of, um, of winners and or losers. He wants to paint pictures of men that look like people that you know, men that could be your husband, your brother, your child, and he wants you to have sort of a personal connection with them. So this is painted like a portrait. This is uh, like a frontal facing um, soldier here who's smiling and looking out at us as he's opening a care package in a really cold uh, snow swept setting here and he's raising up in his hands with either warm socks or a scarf I can't really tell and and the title of the picture is called they remembered me from 1917. So so this figure so this is Norman Rockwell uh, almost trying to make us forget that there's a war and trying to make us feel as as kind of warm and fuzzy as anyone would feel if they were opening up a care package when they were far away from home. So uh, so we can see from uh, another World War I image here, again, the, the focus is not on the battle, it's not on the destruction. Here, Norman Rockwell gives us just a little taste of destruction in the foreground in this uh, 1919 Easter picture. But what his focus here is, is kind of the rebirth after this destruction be and you know how appropriate because it's an easter image so we have these three lovely yellow tulips sprouting out of uh the rubble and then uh this handsome young young gi who's you know conscientiously watering those tulips with water from inside his helmet so this is painting a picture of of a really sort of um kind uh, a soldier here. It's not about uh, a heroic soldier per se, but it's a soldier that again could feel like a family member and could make us feel really proud of the kind of humanitarian work that the soldiers were spread across the globe doing at this time. I should mention too that Norman Rockwell did try to enlist in the Navy during World War I. And if you remember that first picture of him, he was kind of a tall string bean of a man, I believe he weighed about 140 pounds at six feet tall. So he was considered underweight and, um, and he was uh, refused from the Navy. He, and the story is, is that he went home and binged on milkshakes and bananas and then got into the Navy a few days later, but he was a military artist and he never actually saw any battle while he was uh, serving as a military artist. The last World War I image I wanted to show you is this one here. This is from 1919. And so here we have a soldier triumphantly returning home and Norman Rockwell has used his, um, used his skill at, at telling jokes here, using his wit to, uh, to make, make viewers smile in this case. So the, our hero is this young man who is highly decorated. We see all these ribbons on his chest and you know this very sort of confidence mar confident march forward, determined look on his face, but he's surrounded by these laughing silly boys who are so happy to see him. You can imagine it's all the neighborhood kids. And then you know it, Norman Rockwell really goes in for the kill with this chubby little boy 
boy in the front who's got the um, bucket on his head like it's a helmet and his own kind of improvised uh, ribbons on his chest here. So again, there's some, someone for everyone to connect with here, whether it's the soldier or the little boys here, you feel like in some way you know and can recognize everybody in this picture. All right, so enter World War II. I wanted to give you a taste in terms of what Norman Rockwell is doing for World War II. And, and here we can sort of see the themes from World War I coming right in with an even more sophisticated style of painting than Norman Rockwell was using um, in, the, in the years of World War I. So here we've got uh, more rich detail. Uh, and, and of course, there's, there's some context and setting to this picture as well. We don't see that in every single World War II picture, but, but there's a richness here that has developed. So again, Norman Rockwell did not go into battle. He was not like embedded with, with the troops. He stayed at home, but he wanted to tell compelling stories. And this is a really compelling story right here, but it's not about battle at all. Again, it's, it's about uh, American soldiers being heroic in other ways uh, with their humanitarianism. So this is sort of like the World War II version of the soldier who's watering the tulips. But in this case, he's feeding a young child who um, who's, seems like a refugee of war here. She doesn't have any shoes on. And of course, she's old enough to feed herself. But there's an incredible kindness in this man's eyes and, and a connection as he's feeding her and taking care of her. So he has um, very obviously laid down his weapon, which is in the right foreground, and he is focusing more on, on sort of rebuilding and connection as opposed to uh, the destruction that comes with war. So what I want to do next is introduce you to the, the character of Willie Gillis. This was a really important part of Nor Norman Rockwell's uh, uh, paintings for World War II. And Willie Gillis is this young man who you see here in an image called Convoy. Willie Gillis was a character that Norman Rockwell invented in order to tell the story of the war. Since he didn't have access to real soldiers, he would instead invent one. <laughs> so, so what we have here is um, a, a little boy, literally a little boy. He was 15. Uh, the model, I should say, for Willie Gillis was 15, and he stood about five feet, four inches tall. And Norman Rockwell met him at a square dance in Vermont and thought, this is my Willie Gillis. And Willie, the concept of Willie was that he was this really young boy thrown into the chaos of war. And, um, and the more America saw of him through the Saturday evening post covers, the more that they could relate to him. Again, it's, it's um, this feeling like, like he is the boy next door or your own son. So, uh, so I should mention here too how important Norman Rockwell's process was because he wasn't just finding a model and painting them and sending off the images. He found a model and he would photograph them in um, very sort of particular poses. And sometimes he would take anywhere from 50 to 100 photographs of, of a particular model to capture the exact pose he's looking for. And you'll notice that when it comes to Willie Gillis, it's all about the eyebrows. <laughs> um, and so then he would take the photographs and, and work from that and create, create these very detailed paintings from the photographs. So the model was really important and the photography was really important. So he had that all sort of come together with his young model here, a man by the name of um, Robert Otis Buck. So here is one of the first covers for the Saturday Evening Post that involved Willie Gillis. And we can see here he's at training and he has received a, a package from home that has been marked food, no, um, no delay. <laughs> and uh, you don't even have to have been to war here to to relate to this. Uh, even if you, you know, for me, I, being at college, you get a you get a care package that has food in it, and of course, everybody you know just descends. So here we sort of comically have all of these other soldiers who are fanning out behind him, almost like you know the feathers of a peacock here, and they all look sort of silly and and very determined. You know, they all have clenched fists to break into that package at the same time that Willie Gillis is, and of course, his small stature is sort of reinforced by this composition here. So we're starting off with a little bit of humor, of course. 
Norman Rockwell loves to, to give his audiences uh, these moments of, um, of, of, of these kind of sweet, relatable, really sort of universal experiences. And so here we have Willie Gillis, Home on Leave. And I think it's really important to look at the date here as well. This is 1941, just before Pearl Harbor. So Willie Gillis is home on leave and he's doing that most wonderful thing when you can crawl into your own bed after a long time away. And Rockwell has given us all the, all the wonderful details here. We can just, we can see how, how Willie Gillis has, you know, taken off his shoes and peeled off his socks and, and the rest of, of his uniform. And he's resting so happily under this kind of tattered old quilt that you can imagine has been passed through the family for forever. We can see on the clock here that it looks like it's sometime after 10 and we still have light streaming through the windows here. So Willie Gillis is sleeping in. <laughs> we can't see his face, but you can imagine there's a big smile spread across that, that, that face at this moment. Then of course, America enters the war and these images begin, begin to change. And it's also around the time when America becomes more deeply invested in the character of Willie Gillis. And so um, this image shows Willie um, doing kitchen patrol. He has this bucket of apples that he's supposed to be peeling, but he's opened up his mail and, um, and he's received all of these newspapers, these annotated newspapers from his family. And he's reading the hometown news. And of course he's got those arched eyebrows again. And so it was around this time that people began to uh, write into the Saturday Evening Post and ask for updates on Willie. How is Willie doing? Is he in harm's way? And it became clear that there was a number of Americans that thought that Willie Gillis was a real person. And they were, like I said, deeply invested in him. So Norman Rockwell was doing everything right in terms of how he was painting him because people cared about him. Uh, Norman Rockwell shows Willie Gillis in church, reinforcing again, this is a good little boy who, um, who should be reminding you of your son uh, or, or the boy next door. And so we see him sitting by himself here in a church pew, looking solemn and, um, and looking, you know, uh, very much like a respectable young man. But Norman Rockwell also shows us Willie Gillis getting into trouble. And his trouble most often involves women. <laughs> so in this case, we have Willie Gillis at uh, USO. He's being flanked by these two uh, gorgeous women. And it seems like it's the most female attention he has maybe ever gotten. So they form this great composition framing him. And he's looking directly out at us. Note the eyebrows and the big um, eyes. and. And, and even the bulging cheeks here as they're just, they seem to be sort of stuffing his mouth with all sorts of little pastries and treats. Some of them are sliding off of his lap and his cup literally runneth over. So Willie Gillis is, is enjoying some aspects of, of uh, being in the service. And, and that is seen again here in Willie Gillis, What to Do in a Blackout. He's reading this, pan we've got the black background and we've got Willie Gillis's face here and he's holding and um, supposedly reading What to Do in a Blackout. But we can tell that this lovely woman has come up behind him and she has her hands sort of spread out, her fingers kind of fanning on his shoulder as she's reading the pamphlet her fingers sort of echoing that great feather in her cap. And of course, Willie Gillis is eyeballing her because he knows exactly what to do in a blackout. So Willie Gillis gets into some more trouble with the ladies. And actually this is around the time that Norman Rockwell gets into some trouble too, because his model enlists in the military and ships off. <laughs> and then that means that Norman Rockwell, uh, I mean, literally feels like he can no longer paint Willie Gillis, except for maybe from some little sketches that he has lying around. So he has to come up with, uh, with new storylines and a new approach to the story of Willie Gillis. So here he's focusing on um, Willie Gillis's girlfriend. And this, this is a picture that's called Double Trouble. And what's happened here is we've got two uh, women who are neighbors. They're both out working on their lawns and they've opened their mail and they've discovered that they've both been communicating with Willie Gillis. So there's, you know, accusations flying. And if I had to guess, 
I didn't know, I would say that the woman in white was sort of going to win this argument because she seems, uh, or her pose is much more aggressive. She seems taller. Um, she seems more defiant here and angry. But Norman Rockwell loves to paint redheaded women. And in the end, it's the redhead that becomes Willie Gillis's girlfriend. And we see her here in um, on a New Year's Eve cover for the Saturday Evening Post in 1944. And Rockwell is showing us what a devoted girlfriend she is because it's midnight on New Year's Eve. And she's sound asleep. She doesn't even wait to stay up till, you know, the new year rings in. We can see that she fell asleep reading letters from her sweetheart. And then there's these kind of silly pictures of Willie Gillis all around her bed. And, you know, in terms of the composition, it's a, it's a lovely sort of um, relationship with that, with that previous picture of Willie Gillis in his bed. Uh, Norman Rockwell switches it up at one point. It's not just about Willie Gillis and his love life. It's about um, Willie Gillis's family and American history too. So in this picture, we see uh, Willie Gillis in a portrait in the foreground, but we have this sort of slice of a Victorian style living room. And in addition to this kind of busy wallpaper on the wall, we have family portraits going back to the revolution, showing how Gillis family members, uh, men from the Gillis family, had participated in all of these different wars in, in American history. And then along the bottom, uh, we have a uh, Gillis family genealogy, great American heroes, Gillis at Gettysburg. And again, this is another storyline that a lot of Americans would have related to. Uh, not only did they have a loved one who was uh, fighting abroad, but they probably had um, older relatives and then ancestors too that had sort of nobly stepped up for, um, for different causes throughout the years. All right, so how do you end the story of this fictitious character? Norman Rockwell finds a great solution here. I love this picture. This was painted in 1946. The war is over, so what happens to Willie Gillis? He goes to college. He benefits from the GI Bill. And here he is sitting in his college dorm room on, this, on the windowsill, uh, taking in a textbook. He's surrounded by other books. We can see the steeple of, of a church. And, and I think that this has been identified as Middlebury College, which makes sense. Norman Rockwell was living in Vermont. And the symbols of, of um, Willie Gillis's service are still surround him. Uh, complete with his helmet up above, but the sun shining in, the pipe in his mouth, and even the golf clubs over here in the lower right kind of show us that he's he's connected to his past, but but it's afforded him um, the pleasure of, of learning and the opportunity of learning, and also the, this kind of life of leisure too, setting him up for a, a good life going forward, most definitely. So that's our Willie Gillis seg section. Let's turn our attention to probably the best known images that Norman Rockwell has painted for, um, for World War II. And it's these four pictures, these four iconic images called the Four Freedoms. And as much as, as often as I look at these pictures and talk about them, I, have to say, I just love them. They're so rewarding to look at. So here are all four of the images together. We have from left to right, the freedom uh, of speech, the freedom of religion, the freedom from want, and the freedom from fear. And the, the subject for these pictures were, was inspired by Franklin Delano Roosevelt's 1941 State of the Union speech, when he references all of these kind of universal freedoms and the freedoms that Americans enjoy. Norman Rockwell was incredibly inspired by that, and he was determined to paint them. But I want to emphasize to everyone right now how difficult it is to visualize these concepts. If somebody handed you a pencil right now and said, draw me freedom from want, <laughs> I mean, how would you even begin? I don't know where I would begin. Um, and so Norman Rockwell really labored over these images. He worked on them for seven months. And during that time, he lost 15 pounds. And we already know that he didn't have a lot of weight that he could lose. So this was a struggle. And, um, and before I, I will look at each one sort of individually and, and if there are sketches available, look at them too. But as we're looking at all four of them together, I want you to think of which one sort of doesn't belong, which one 
sort of sticks out in a weird way. And we'll talk about why in just a moment. So let's start off with freedom of speech. Uh, this is such a, such a powerful image. I love this image. Uh, and Norman Rockwell is telling a story with a lot of these four freedoms pictures. And in this case, what he envisioned was a, uh, a town meeting in a small New England town and that somebody would stand up who didn't necessarily fit in and maybe didn't share the same ideas with most of the other town members, but he still afforded the opportunity to speak his mind. And I think that that comes across pretty clearly here. Um, particularly because this man is wearing, you know, a flannel shirt and kind of a tattered, dirty jacket. And we look around and the other gentlemen surrounding him are wearing, you know, smart little blazers and, and with, with uh, ties on, but they're still so, sort of leaning in and interested in what this man has to say. And the man is standing there so, oh, almost like seemingly captivated by his own voice as he's speaking. So I wanted to show you, and I, I apologize for the, the quality of this image, but I wanted to show you uh, Norman Rockwell's first attempt at this idea of freedom of speech. And as, as you look at the two of these together, you can sort of see that, that the image on the right, the final image, is a much stronger image. It really focuses on that speaker. And over here, you sort of get the sense that the other community members are sort of annoyed by this young man who has stood up and, and, and started speaking. You don't get the same kind of reverence or respect that we see ultimately in the final picture. Um, and of course, because of the composition over here and, and the way that uh, this young man is framed by, by all of these other figures, he doesn't stand out as such a powerful character. But of course, in the final picture, he does. Many people have uh, drawn a connection between this standing figure who's speaking and images of, of Abraham Lincoln. A lot of people say he looks like Abraham Lincoln. It makes sense. Abraham Lincoln was a, a great orator. And so um, I bring in a, a portrait that Norman Rockwell had painted of Abraham Lincoln. Um, and you can sort of see how, how they're similar. And Norman Rockwell said about this image on, on the left, if you want to exalt someone, shoot them from below makes them seem so so special and, and so heroic and he's done that with his with his speaker in freedom of speech so so that gives us a, a sense of this image let's move on to freedom of religion and this is such an interesting picture here it's sort of monochromatic uh these kind of uh kind of dull kind of uh, gray tones and, and beige tones here. And what we see are these highly detailed faces and hands, uh, generally of, well, of, of a diverse range of people and ages and, and, and ethnicities and religions, but everybody's generally facing in the same direction, sort of underscoring the fact that, you know, no matter who you're praying to, it's like just as long as you're praying, but we all have that in common. And, um, and this is the picture that for me really stands out as being different. Norman Rockwell had a completely different concept for freedom of religion that sort of fit in more with the other four freedoms pictures uh, in, the, in that it's more, um, it's more about storytelling and it had more vibrant colors in it too. But the original concept was to, um, to show people of different faiths gathering together um, in a congenial way in a barber shop. And ultimately, Norman Rockwell felt like he was relying a little too heavily on stereotypes of people from different religions, um, particularly with the Jewish man in, in, the barber, in the barber's chair here. So he abandoned that concept and he went for these very large heads instead. All right, our freedom from want. And this is like the perfect picture to talk about this week too, because I think so many people think that this is just a picture of Thanksgiving, but it's so much more. Uh, this is a painting that was done fresh off the heels of the Great Depression. And Norman Rockwell is showing us a, a family gathering where food or um, an interest in eating is, is almost secondary, e even though the bird, is the, the turkey here is dead center. We have all these people, multiple generations of this family uh, looking at each other and smiling at each other and leaning in to enjoy each other's company. 
And we even have this, this gentleman in the lower right hand corner who's looking out at us, extending the table to us, and we feel like we're a part of this gathering. So this is Norman Rockwell emphasizing that when there is a freedom from want, uh, uh, the focus of a family gathering isn't necessarily the food, it's, it's uh, the human connection here which he just, he communicates so brilliantly. But I think, I, I think modern day Americans sort of miss the point of this. I think we all feel like the more food, the better because of this giant bird in Norman Rockwell's painting. And of course, the funny story that goes along with this is that uh, the matriarch of this family uh, was his, uh, the model for, for this, for this uh, person here was Norman Rockwell's housekeeper. And she actually cooked the turkey that she modeled with. And then ultimately she and Norman Rockwell sat down and ate the turkey. And Norman Rockwell said, that was the only model I've ever eaten. So we have freedom from want, and then our last one is freedom from fear. And um, as a mother of young kids, I have to say, this is this is the picture that really resonates with me these days. It, we have uh, two parents tucking in their little kids into bed at night, and we have all of these uh, strong kind of architectural lines reinforcing this kind of downward slope that takes our eyes from the parents down to the you know angelic faces of their of their kids and you're just you know these are the moments where you you know kind of fall in love with your kids all over again when they're sleeping and and so sweet looking and right at the center of this picture in the father's hands we have a folded newspaper and if you tilt your head you might be able to see the headline there there's only a few words that are legible but it's bombings and horror so Norman Rockwell is showing us that in other parts of the world, there's um, all sorts of, of death, destruction, things that are, are terrifying. And these parents get to, you know, because they live in America, they get to tuck in their kids without that fear that, um, that anything could happen to the safety and security of their family overnight. So it's a, it's a lovely concept for um, what could otherwise be kind of a, uh, an opportunity to create something that's, that's much more harrowing or, or, or terrifying. And Norman Rockwell does it in, in like the most heartwarming way imaginable. Okay, so we've got our four freedoms here. Let's talk about how Norman Rockwell uh, depicts heroes at home. And this is really all he can do because he's not at the battlefield and he's not uh, right there with soldiers. So he has a couple of different ways of doing it. Um, in some ways, he focuses on everyday people uh, and how they're living their lives. And he decided he wanted to paint the rationing office in a small town. And so he reached out to a local rationing board and asked if he could come in and observe the process and, and paint them. And they said, yes, you may, but you, you have to make us look good. <laughs> and Norman Rockwell said, well, if I do that, will you give me some more rations? And they said, no, but if you make us look bad, we'll take away what you have. <laughs> so Norman Rockwell um, was well incentivized to, to make this um, kind of a, a, a good looking process. And he, we can see here that he has painted himself into the scene over here on the left with his, um, with his pipe. And then we have uh, this array of community members who are set up at this kind of haphazard table and um, a respectable middle-class man who, is, who has come in to plead his case uh, that he might require some more rations. So this, this picture on its own, I think, uh, is a re really strong picture. You really get the sense of this man's humility here as he comes before them to make this request. And then kind of how the community is represented in this rationing board. But I think the most fascinating part of this picture uh, are, are um, the, the sketches that Norman Rockwell did of all the different people that came before the rationing board at that time. And these sketches show like every walk of life, you know, a mother with four tiny kids, um, a, a young handsome couple, an older woman on her own. And so we can imagine all of the troubles that all of these people were facing and, um, and just what that rationing board might have afforded them and in this time of need. So we go from the really real <laughs> rationing board to um, a character that is more allegorical. 
This is a 1943 painting called Liberty Girl. Sometimes it's called Rosie to the Rescue. And so I call this allegorical because this is supposed to stand in for every American woman, hence the stars and stripes on her clothes. She's a redhead because Norman Rockwell loves his redheads. And here she is literally wearing many hats. <laughs> and she's got the tools of the trade of many different trades here. I can make out at the very least, and there's several things here that I can't even totally decipher. So if somebody can make out what's on her back here, I'd love some insight into that or what this round object is with the leather strap. But I do see a, an oil can, a big giant wrench, a lantern down here. She's delivering milk. She's got um, gardening tools for a Liberty Garden. She's got uh, her, her books uh, sort of uh, tagging along behind her. She's got a mop, a dustpan, a watering can. So there's a lot going on here that shows uh, all the many ways that all American women were uh, kind of holding down the fort and supporting the war effort. And I love that this woman is kind of lumbering forward. We see that she's burdened by all of this, but she still looks so determined to keep going, so determined that she's seemingly unaware of our presence too. So she seems like a good kind of precursor uh, to, to our Rosie the Riveter, one of um, the most famous characters, invented characters to come out of, um, well, not fully invented, uh, an inspired character to come out of World War II. And she was also painted in 1943. And I wish we were all together in the same room right now because there's something about this painting that just puts a smile on people's faces. Oftentimes when I bring this up on a screen in a room full of people, everybody sort of starts to chuckle. There's something about Rosie that is just so wonderful. And um, I, I, I hesitate to say that it's all about that ham sandwich, but for me, a big part of it is the ham sandwich and the look on her face too. There's a, a, an overwhelming sense of confidence here as she sort of looks down her nose, you know, head held high. But of course, Rosie here is, is depicted as almost no woman in the history of art has ever been depicted. She is huge and muscular. She's wearing the clothes of a man right down to those penny loafers too, right? And she has this massive riveting gun on her lap in addition to her, her lunchbox. So, um, so the hose that connects that riveting gun uh, sort of snakes down here and brings our eye down to Adolf Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, right down at the, at, in the foreground center. And we can see Rosie's penny loafer is stepping on it, literally squashing out Nazism. And so that's where all of that, that supreme confidence comes from um, as she's eating that ham sandwich. And if you look really closely, you can see that Norman Rockwell has even given Rosie a faint little halo up there. So there's something, you know, saintly in the work that she is doing. Now, uh, Norman Rockwell was inspired to create Rosie or this depiction of Rosie from images of prophets on the Sistine Chapel ceiling from about 500 years earlier. And Michelangelo had famously painted these prophets, uh, just you know, enormous, massive figures, monumental figures that could be um, sort of legibly understood from the floor of the Sistine Chapel, 70 feet below. Um, and of course, Norman Rock, or I'm sorry, Michelangelo loved muscles. So these were all uh, really big, impressive figures. And Rockwell sort of borrows all of those big muscles from Michelangelo, gives them to Rosie, and then of course, adds that wonderful ham sandwich. <laughs> so, um, so what I would love to sort of emphasize here is that throughout the history of art, if there's a woman painted who has a little halo over her head, she's really most likely to have a, a baby in her arms. That's, I mean, that's been the standard for hundreds of years. Uh, and it's sort of revolutionary of Norman Rockwell to paint a woman with a halo and a massive piece of uh, manufacturing equipment on her lap. So so I, I just, I, I have like a, a whole new respect for Norman Rockwell every time I see this picture because it is so um, so boundary breaking in some ways and then also it's wonderful in the way that it honors the history of art as well.
All right, a quick glimpse at a few other heroes at home. Norman Rockwell did a number of pictures of, of um, servicemen on leave. So here enjoying a nap in a hammock with the family dog, shoes off. The sailor um, is just uh, enjoying, you know, the nicest afternoon imaginable. We can all sort of relate to just the physical pleasure of, of being in that hammock. And then over here, um, a, a, another serviceman uh, traveling on a train with his sweetheart. And we can, we don't even see their faces, but we see how connected they are at the head and how their feet are connected. And we can, we, we can imagine how can, how connected these two, um, characters are and, and almost like put ourselves in their positions. And then we're almost that jealous little girl who's peeking over the top of, of, of the, of the seat there because they're just so enjoying each other's company in that moment in such a beautiful way. And Norman Rockwell has to handle this with a little bit of, of humor every now and then too. It can't all just be saccharine stuff. So here we see, um, <laughs> a, uh, a sailor who's home on leave updating his tattoos. So he's sitting here in a tattoo parlor. We see the sailor sitting in profile, the tattoo artist we see from behind. And, um, and the joke here is, of course, that the, the sailor um, is crossing off yet another woman's name on his arm and adding what I think is a sixth or seventh name to the list of women that he loves. <laughs> and I'm sure things are gonna work out great between him and Betty, even though he he looks a little bit nervous about this prospect as well. Um, in terms of Norman Rockwell's attention to detail here too, just look at how um, this, this sailor's cap is sort of back on his head in this picture, but you can tell from his tan line, it's usually worn sort of further down. And here's the photograph that Norman Rockwell worked from, or one of the photographs that Norman Rockwell worked from in order to create that image. All right, so we are going to finish up with Norman Rockwell's depictions of homecomings. And this is gonna just kind of warm the cockles of your heart as we go through this, because he's so good at reunions. This is like uh, Norman Rockwell's bread and butter. So his first image here is called Homecomings. This is from 1945, the war, the, the war has ended and um, these young soldiers are coming home. This is such a powerful image. And I, I love it every, every time I see it. Norman Rockwell it, uh, traveled to Troy, New York, and he found a neighborhood that sort of inspired the setting here. And he really sort of diligently copied what he saw while he was at that neighborhood. And so it's, um, it's not an idealized place at all. It's kind of dirty and scrappy looking. And so we see this young soldier who's come home and his immediate family is kind of spilling out of their door, surprised and overjoyed to see him. His mother with her arms wide open, his siblings kind of pouring down the steps. I love how this little boy, his feet don't even touch the ground. And of course, if you've ever had a dog, you know that there's nothing as great as a dog's welcome um, after, after a long time away. And then we see the rest of the community looking up, uh, coming out of their doors, out of their windows, peeking over the fence. Everyone is so happy to see this young man return. And, and then of course, you've got the girlfriend who is sort of pressed up against the wall, kind of hidden away from everybody else, looking forward to her own reunion with this young man. We don't see his face, uh, we see him from behind. And so we sort of experience this picture through his eyes and, um, and get the sense of just how wonderful it would be to be greeted in this way. I think one of the keys to understanding this picture too is all of these stars that are posted around this neighborhood, including up here where we see a series of three stars. So the blue stars were posted when a family member, when, when a family had um, a, a young man who was off at war. And of course, those stars would become gold stars if they lost a loved one. So what we can see here is that this is a community that has sent off so many young men into war and everyone was probably looking forward to a reunion like this. We see one man coming back and it is cause for the entire neighborhood to feel, um, to share in the joy of his return. Such a powerful image. 
I just wanted to share with you in contrast another major illustrator's um, depiction of the same concept. So this is N.C. Wyatt's Homecoming from the same year. And instead of seeing, you know, the whole community uh, coming out and, and broad smiles on people's faces, here we just have the dog. And, um, and sort of these kind of somber colors uh, spreading across the family farm. And again, only seeing the, the servicemen from behind. And so here, I think we're kind of forced to, uh, to, to put ourselves more in his mind um, than, than over here where we're kind of putting ourselves in his heart. And, and, he, and with N.C. Wyeth, I think it, you're, you're more likely to think of kind of the darker side of, of, of what he might be thinking and feeling in this moment. That's not necessarily, that's not to say that um, Norman Rockwell never focused on more somber themes related to the war. And this image that we had started with called Homecoming Marine is probably one of the most somber pictures that he painted to, out of World War II. And what we see here is a young man who had worked in this garage. You can see from this poster newspaper clipping from behind uh, where it refers to uh, a hero garageman. So he's, he's gone, he's served, he's become a hero at war. Of course, the Blue Star was there to signify that he was away at war. Um, he's gone and he's served and now he's come back. And, and the people in his community are interested in the story that made him this hero. Uh, and, it, and I love this because it's, it's people of all ages. This, uh, this gentleman in the foreground here is probably the oldest picture or the oldest person in this picture, but, but it goes you know, sort of from young to old. And they're all leaning in, they're all expectant. And you sort of get the sense that this young man, this young Marine is a little bit reticent to tell the story. He's home now. And um, and this is a, this is a whole different place, and this is people who know him differently, and and so this is like the the um, this hesitancy here, I think, makes this uh, a more kind of somber scene, even though there's this light spilling in on on the whole picture. But for the most part, Norman Rockwell wants to give us these pictures that kind of pull at the heartstrings. And this is a picture that I think does that so effectively. This is a picture that we should all be looking at again in a couple of days as we sit down to our Thanksgiving meals. And, and, and probably it's good to look at something like this because it helps us reflect upon the fact that you don't need to serve meal, a meal to, you know, 12 or 20 people, it's, you can have a really joyous day just looking at, you know, the members of your immediate family too. So here we have a mother looking at her son who has returned home from the Air Force. We also have kind of the freedom from want theme. There's so much food here. And even though KP was such a dreaded chore when he was in the military, he's happily peeling potatoes with his mother. And, um, and then the sweetest detail here is how he has his feet up on that top rung of the chair and he's sitting there like a little boy and she's looking at him with love and pride at, at the man that he has become. It's such a lovely picture. Um, apparently Norman Rockwell offered it to, um, as a gift to the people who modeled for him, um, which was a real veteran and his mother. But apparently Norman Rockwell added about 40 pounds to the woman just to make her look a little bit more matronly. And I think they actually declined the painting because the mother just didn't look as good as she did in real life. <laughs> this is another picture about um, transformations. And this young man who has returned home from war, he's taken off his uniform, he's put on an old suit, and, he, and he's sort of getting a kick out of how much he has changed since he... Um, since he went off to war. I love this sort of slice of his face that we see in, in the mirror here, and then all the details of his bedroom too. So the world has changed and, and he has really changed. Norman Rockwell has also given us some more good reunions with, um, with servicemen and their sweethearts. This is called Christmas Shoppers, uh, Chicago Christmas Shoppers. So this is Union Station in Chicago. And of course, the focus here is Christmas. We've got people with, with presents under their arms, a Santa who's raising money, men with trees and reeds and that sort of thing. But throughout this picture, if you've got really good eyes, we've got people smooching, <laughs> just a lot of smooching going on in this picture. It always reminds me of, um, of the famous VJ Day 
photograph from Times Square. But, um, but Norman Rockwell has sort of embedded them in this busy, chaotic scene where people are coming and going. But it's nice to have those kind of romantic reunions as well. So then following the war, I only have two pictures to kind of follow up on this. Norman Rockwell um, painted this picture of a disabled veteran who is at the center of this picture called the Long Shadow of Lincoln. And all around this veteran, Norman Rockwell is showing us how Americans are kind of coming together, not just to kind of rebuild the country or make the country stronger, but to kind of rebuild the world and lead in the world. So, um, so we have an architect, we've got a teacher, we have people in prayer here, we have um, you know, the American sort of nuclear family, and then this gentleman who's kind of leaning over to offer a hand up. And so this is as much a picture about the state of the country as it is a picture about the state of this man's body. So we'll wrap up tonight with one of Norman Rockwell's last assignments for World War II, and that is an assignment to paint the Statue of Liberty for the 1946 July, 4th of July cover of the Saturday Evening Post. And the image that I have here on the left is a painting of, of um, the Statue of Liberty done by a different artist for the Saturday Evening Post. She was actually a fairly frequent subject and she was almost always depicted the way you see her here. Um, the entire statue with, you know, of course, the torch raised up over her head and, um, and, and you, you, you get the, the full sense of, of the statue and, and the meaning behind it. And Norman Rockwell wanted to take sort of a different approach. And of course, he's a storyteller and he wanted to tell um, the stories of Americans here. So one of his earliest drafts shows the statue is kind of minimized. And instead, you see all of these figures down um, below at the pedestal kind of contemplating the statue. He ultimately abandons that concept and he got in touch with the organization that runs the statue and he said, do you have any photographs of people cleaning the Statue of Liberty? And they said, no, we don't even do that, but we do have these men who come and clean the torch. And so Norman Rockwell got photographs of that. And from there, he created this incredible image. I think it's really, somehow I just think it's so amazing that somebody said, paint the Statue of Liberty and this is the perspective that he gives us. Um, he essentially crops out almost all of the statue, um, which I think for many other artists would be like, you know, cropping out the whole concept here. But what he emphasizes, of course, is, um, is the torch and this idea of holding this torch aloft and how America has become the leader of the world and is guiding the rest of the world it, um, with this concept of liberty and how important and incredible that is. Um, so he includes these tiny figures who are at work cleaning this heavy leaded amber glass um, that's in the torch and, and that becomes the focus. And this is such a well done picture. And just, I mean, I, I think we could sort of take it for granted how kind of revolutionary it is in, in its perspective too. But this picture in particular has found its way into the collection of the White House Historical Association. And it's been considered so significant for so long that it, it, was, um, it was exhibited in the Oval Office for many, many years. So, so Norman Rockwell's depictions of, of World War II um, are, are, have this incredible legacy, to say the least. <laughs> so um, since that is one of the last images that Norman Rockwell created around this subject, I think this is a great point for us to, to wrap up. But I welcome any questions or comments anybody has about Norman Rockwell or these pictures. Thank you so much, Jane. That was wonderful. Again, as always, um, do you do you know if the does the Oval Office rotate those those pictures? Did Obama pick that picture to go in there? Um, I'm not sure if he personally picked it, but I do know. Um, and you probably remember this from my other Norman Rockwell talk that this okay. picture was reinstalled um, along with the the bust of Martin Luther King Jr. after they realized that 
Norman Rockwell had significantly included one of the workers here as, as a black man, which was actually not allowed on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post at this time. Wow. So this was, um, this was another sort of revolutionary element to this picture in particular, showing how um, people of different races were contributing to this idea of liberty and, and America's leadership. So, so I think, um, I think it was during Obama's presidency that that revelation sort of came about. And so this was reinstalled along with um, the, the bust of Martin Luther King Jr. That's great. That's um, such a really neat picture. Um, there was someone who said that did any, did, I don't know, they, they mentioned that there was um, the, the man speaking during the town meeting. Mm. Um, was there any thoughts about that being significant? I mean, I know he was working class and everything, but was there any thoughts about that being a man as opposed to a woman? I guess he had Rosie the Riveter later on, um, but was it free speech to all men as opposed to free speech to all? <clears throat> that's, a, that's a really interesting question. And um, it's, I, I did notice that these two, uh, both of these images, uh, the earlier sketch and then the final picture too, they do, they're definitely sort of, there's heavy representation of the men in the community, right? Yeah. <laughs> And so I, I, I don't get the sense that Norman Rockwell was trying to say freedom of speech just for men. Um, I, my hunch is that he was, based on his own experiences at small town meetings in mm -hmm. New England, they were probably um, more heavily attended by the men of the household than the women. But so I think it's probably pretty significant that he still included women in these scenes. Yeah, that's I, I noticed that throughout all of his art, actually, all of the art that you were talking about today, that he he tried to be as inclusive as he could without, you know, being tokenist, without you know being yeah. token. He he tried to stay true to the um, to yeah. America. But like you said in your other, like you were talking about in your other presentation on Rockwell, yeah. he did eventually come round to the the idea that we should be a bit more revolutionary in our art. Right. Right. Um, so, so the then further on, there's a picture of a woman with a bunch of things on her. She's running around a bunch of things yes. on her back right before Rosie the Riveter. Yeah. And some people were wondering if um, is that a typewriter on her back? I I am not sure. I need to delve into this a little bit more. Um, somebody uh, I recently gave this program um, to a different audience, and somebody suggested that it looked like a small engine. But I'm not sure <laughs> for what that would be. Um, yeah, she, she is wearing this headset, which makes me feel like she's, you know, uh, An operator. Yeah, exactly. So I wonder if that's related to that. It's it's yeah. so hard to know, and um, I'm gonna have to go back to my books. There's I, I I did like a quick search online, and I didn't come up with anything on this. So. But I, I mean, it does seem like everything, every element here has a, a significant uh, meaning behind it. So it, it seems really important to know what that is, but that does seem to be what's causing her to hunch over too. Yeah, yeah, she seems to be pulling on it a bit. Yeah, yeah. another person suggested that um, the round object was either a time clock or a compass, maybe? Yeah, yeah, I could definitely see it as a, as a compass. Um, and maybe she's doing something related to navigation. It's hard to know. And do we know anything further on with the veteran who's talking to the group in the garage? Do we know anything about the significance of him holding the Japanese flag? Um, he must have been involved in the conflict there. Right. Um, but what is the significance of him holding it during that conversation? Is he teaching them something about it? That's a, that's a good question. Um, sorry, I didn't mention the flag uh, as I was looking at this. Um, I think that, I mean, I, my take on it was it sort of just gives kind of a place, a setting to, to where, he, um, where he was. And it's, it's really hard to make out the text in, in the background that, that speaks to his heroism. Um, but it, I, I think also in artistic terms, it adds this pop of color to this picture. <laughs> Draws sure. Ryan. Um, it's sort of balanced out by that red frame and with the star in the background. Um, and, and there's just like these little tiny dashes of red throughout. So I think, 
um, I'm sure it sort of advances the story, but it certainly um, adds um, a, a visual interest in this picture too, which I think is important. It really does. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then someone, I, this was a question that I had myself too, and I'm not sure, you, you might have addressed this in the beginning, um, but did Rockwell, what kind of formal training did Rockwell have? Oh, yes. So, um, so he was trained at um, the National Academy of Design, I want to say, and then also the Art Students League. Um, so he did have, I mean, he had, he had excellent sort of formal training that, um, you know, many other artists who have gone on as fine art artists uh, have, have had similar training. And certainly at the time that he was living, I mean, if you uh, attended the Edward Hopper presentation, we know that um, Norman Rockwell was just a, a little bit younger than Edward Hopper. And Edward Hopper was, was the one who went to school to become an illustrator. <laughs> so, so there were opportunities to specialize in illustration, but Norman Rockwell had, had a fine arts background. It's so interesting that he chose to be such a, a realistic, uh, journalistic um, illustrator instead of being a fine artist. Steady work, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, I was also going to comment on the fact that he is one of those artists, those rare artists that's popular in their lifetime, that's extremely popular in their lifetime, like actually making money from their art. But you would know better if that that might be more the case than than I would. But it seems like the common theme is that they they die and then become famous. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> he got a steady paycheck and, you know, and you know, middle-class America fell in love with him. And mm -hmm. now, um, you know, uh, art historians are falling in love with him. <laughs> yeah, that's great. No, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was a really wonderful presentation and we're just getting so many comments about how, how wonderful the presentation was. And um, let's see, earlier on, some people were surprised that he even, he even did those earlier pictures. And... Oh yeah, the World War One pictures, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And let's see, I'm just going through really quick to, oh, and, and someone was just amazed at the, the, the newsprint details were just so fantastic too, that he was able to kind of incorporate that for, for added, added context to the pictures. Yes. yes. Um, I mean, he, he was just unbelievable in terms of um, <laughs> his keys. detail, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, no, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Jane, for another wonderful presentation. My pleasure. Um, so the next, uh, Jane will be presenting one more program this year, um, and that is on December the 22nd, and it's going to be Vincent Van Gogh, and I think that's going to be a wonderful, pro wonderful program. You can register on our calendar, um, and I will send out that registration link along with the recording for this program um, at probably tomorrow. So thank you so much, Jane, and have a wonderful uh, Thanksgiving holiday. Thank you, th and to everyone else here too. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Take care. Bye now. Bye.